Okay, got it up there. All right. So basically, I've been asked to talk about research and cervical dystonia, including clinical trials and what that involves. Now this is important because as you've heard before, we have some new toxins that are being developed. And that seems to be the trend so far in treating dystonia. So uh, if you wanted to participate in these clinical trials, you have to know a little bit more about what it is, what it involves. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Now, when you look at the research in cervical dystonia, there's several different ways that you can research this disorder. You have the research on the disorder itself. What is the natural history? How the disease presents? Just like what Dr. Drake Duane was talking about, that's a very big and important part of research in cervical dystonia. How does it start? What is the pathophysiology? In other words, what is the mechanism by which the dystonia occurs and how it perpetuates itself. So there's lots of research in that and currently I'd say that the most, um, most of the research on pathophysiology has concluded that there is an increase in plasticity and a decrease in inhibition. And you may have heard this before from several of their talks, but this is how the nervous system works. So inhibition means that you don't have extra movements. So if you have a lack of inhibition, you can have more movements. And plasticity means that you can adapt or change. So there's this increase in this ability to change, as well as a reduction in the ability to inhibit extra movements, which we think causes dystonia. So this is a very rough way of, of describing it, but that's basically what the latest research has on uh, pathophysiology. Um, genetics. There's lots and lots of work on genetics. In fact, if you look or if you know about the DYT system, which talks about the genetic forms of dystonia, there are now about 23 of them. So there's many different genes that can cause different types of dystonia. And dystonia, remember, is not just in the neck, but it can affect the face, the eyes, your trunk, your arms, any skeletal muscle can be affected by dystonia. So there's all these different groups of inherited forms of dystonia. So why study genetics? Well, if we have a certain gene that we find out what that gene does in the body, and then we can apply that to how it works out with how it causes dystonia. So that's basically what we found. Now, uh, when I first started researching the genetics of, dysto of cervical dystonia, there weren't any that were just cervical dystonia. They were all generalized dystonia. In fact, it was news when a DYT8, I believe, is the one family from Germany, where they had primarily cervical dystonia. Well, now they've found two additional genes that are important for cervical dystonia, the FAP gene and the ANO3 gene. So these are all new things that they're finding out, and they're trying to put all this together to figure out what happens and why dystonia occurs. So it's, it's much more complicated than what we're, we're saying in terms of the physiology of it. Okay, so the other part, which is what everyone here is interested in, is treatment of cervical dystonia. And that is one of the, uh, another area of important research. So you have medications that Dr. Pathak talked about. And most of the time, medications are not uh, too great. Um, and there haven't been any new trials on medications for cervical dystonia. Uh, there was one that was being developed, but then it kind of fell through. So nothing so far. Um, botulinum toxins. We all know about Botox, Zeoman, Myoblock, Dysport. But what about newer ones, other forms, like um, Dr. Pavic talked about the new one, botulinum toxin type X. This is one that was just described about two years ago. So they're, they're starting to notice this, 
they're starting to see if they can develop it into a nice uh, pharmaceutical agent that can be used for humans and treat um, cervical dystonia. Um, also, surgical treatments. And there's a lot of new things that are coming up with surgical treatments for dis cervical dystonia as well. One of the uh, types of surgery that this gentleman mentioned was peripheral denervation. Um, this is the older form of surgery that we used to have. It is really for very few patients because most of the time, the cervical dystonia involves multiple muscles. In, it, with selective chem, uh, peripheral denervation, they actually cut the nerve to the muscles. If you have a compl complex movement of your neck, you might have too many neck muscles that need to have the nerves cut and it just won't work too well. In fact, the best type of cervical dystonia that works for that is just plain torticollis or the rotatory form where your head is twisted or turned. If it's tilted or if it's pulled back or forward, it doesn't work as well. Uh, and there are a few surgeons who still perform this particular surgery and they will evaluate you and neurologists will also assist with that to see whether you are a candidate for that particular type of surgery or not. Currently, most of the surgical treatment is now focused on deep brain stimulation. And you've probably heard that deep brain stimulation surgery is very good for dystonia. Well, in fact, it really is. Um, there are three different sites that we can put the leads in for uh, deep brain stimulation. And the site we use for dystonia is the globus pallidus interna, the GPI. This site is uh, very good and it helps a lot with generalized dystonia. So dystonia that affects your whole body from your feet all the way up to your head. Uh, and you've probably seen pictures of those pretzel children. These are the inherited forms of generalized dystonia where they're just kind of all twisted. It works exceptionally well for that particular type of dystonia. Now, let's talk about cervical dystonia. Well, it's about 50-50 currently. About 50% of the time you're going to get some good response, 50% of the time not so good response. Uh, so it's not really a treatment I'm going to say, oh, go out and get this now, it's going to help you. But there's new research in DBS where they are becoming a little more selective in how they are choosing which part of that lead to stimulate. So before you'd have just one little lead and it would be like a ball of stimulation that covers the whole thing. Well now they're kind of looking more at particular areas or directions of that stimulation. So I would anticipate that as they work this out a little bit more, that's going to be the next treatment for cervical dystonia when they have a specific way to put the leads in exactly where it needs to be to direct the stimulation exactly where it needs to be so that the neck can be uh, treated. You would have to have both sides done because it's an axial structure. It's not on one side of the body. So you need both sides, both sides of the brain to be stimulated at the same time to work on the cervical dystonia. So th there's lots of research that's going on. Now, uh, I have a, a slide here. One of the best new areas of research are the different botulinum toxins. Um, now, we talked about the botulinum toxin X. Daxi botulinum toxin was listed on Dr. Pathic's slide. That was initially used for, or they were trying to use it for cosmetics. And they were using a surface application, so no injections, a cream or something. That has not really borne out, and that study has stopped. But daxyvashlinum toxin seems to be a good type of toxin. It actually seems to last up to 24 months. That's right, six months, meaning your injections, if you respond well to it, could be twice a year from four times a year. That would be great, wouldn't it? not to have to go through all that every every three months but if we have a longer acting agent that would be great so this is 
actually in phase two studies. So um, I know we are a site for this study at Loma Linda, and we have a few patients that are involved in this. And right now, um, they've closed it to enrollment, but they're enro allowing a few patients to be enrolled in what they call an open label study. Open label means that you get to have the treatment and you're watched closely to see how well you respond because they need more data to support this. They think and they've seen it lasting six months, but they want to make sure that that's true for most people. So they will need more subjects for that. And that's ongoing. So that is your next toxin that's going to probably come out in a few years. Okay, so other ways that research has been done on uh, injections. Um, you know about the different types of injections. What about the way that we inject? There's always way, room for improvement in that, right? Always. So muscle selection, better ways to pick out the right muscles. They're using different techniques, so EMG, can help you with some muscles, but some of the muscles are really deep, so that surface electrode is not really helpful. You can't really quite get down enough to see it um, when you're doing the injections. Uh, you could inject them with the needle each time, but then again, you'd be more like a pin cushion than you would anything else. So you need to have it so where you can identify the muscle. They use ultrasound. So a lot of places are now using ultrasound instead of EMG for muscle selection. It's especially good for deep muscles. There are a few problems. It takes a lot of work to get trained on this and to be able to use it properly, but it does seem to be very favorable and they're starting to give more seminars about this in the medical um, meetings and things. So that's another way to do it. Um, Intervals, injection intervals. Now, why do you have your injections every three months? Does anybody know why they started that? Yes. So, it, what I was told, if you do it more frequently, you can get immune to the to the um, effects of. It. Well, that is one thought, but originally they set the limit at three months because that's when the botulinum toxin completely wears off. It's out of your system. So after it wears off, you get another dose and you go on. But what does that mean for the patient? It means that your symptoms are bad, you get an injection, they get better, but then they get bad and they can get just as bad as they were in the beginning. And sometimes the toxin doesn't even last the full three months. Sometimes people have it lasting two months or even one month. And so you have to get your injections and then you have to wait two months where your symptoms are bad. So they've had some research in how about adjusting the timing of the injections. So the dosing intervals and what they've found is that it's been safe up to eight weeks. And uh, I think they've even been trying six weeks on some patients, but they haven't quite got the studies to that point yet. But they have pretty much settled on eight weeks to so two months. Um, now, as you mentioned, the possibility of uh, antibodies. And Dr. Duane talked to you about the forehead test, how you can test to see if you have antibodies. Anytime your body has a foreign agent or protein in it, it's going to develop antibodies. I mean, that's how your body gets you cured of colds and flus and um, infections. Your body develops antibodies to it, right? So the same thing happens when you get injections of botulinum toxin. Only we don't really want antibodies to this toxin because we want it to work on our muscles. So it's not such a good thing to have antibodies. Now, uh, in the past, um, Botox, or Allergan's product, had a lot of protein in it. And not just the toxin part, but what they call accessory proteins. 
These are proteins that are in the solution, but are not necessarily part of the Botox, you know, part of the toxin molecule itself. Uh, and they thought that was good for stabilization, et cetera. So a lot of people developed antibodies to the toxin because there's a lot of protein in there to develop antibodies against. So once the Allergan cleaned up its preparation, and this happened um, about 10 years ago, possibly a little bit longer, uh, they have not found as frequent of a development of antibodies. So we think that that was why. And so they're not as adamant about that any longer, although people will still develop antibodies. And especially if you're getting injections over a long period of time. So the more, the higher the dose, and the longer that you're getting exposed to it, the greater the frequency or risk of developing antibodies. Um, out of the different toxins, I believe Zeoman has looked particularly at this issue. And so far, they have not really found any antibodies developed against their product. They have tried to make this product very pure with no accessory proteins. So um, that's the only thing that we know at this point about it. Um, doses. I forgot to tell you about doses. Now, remember, I said higher the dose, the more the risk. Well, sometimes people can get away with a very low dose of toxin, and they're fine. 100 units of Botox or Zeoman. Um, sometimes you need 300 units, which is probably one of the higher doses. In fact, it used to be the highest dose you could get. Well, they have done quite a few studies and they have shown that you can actually go up to 400 units. So sometimes people who are getting their injections, they're just not quite getting enough. They can actually go safely up to 400 units. So remember, there, all of this is looking at safety and efficacy. So there's a lot of different studies on that. Um, but th that's what we've found so far. So the next step is talking about clinical research. So what is it like to be part of a study? Now, clinical research trials are required before the FDA can approve a new medication or treatment. So what a clinical trial means is that this is used on people. So they need patients with these conditions to try these um, medications. Okay, this is the process that they use for getting a medication approved by the FDA. So first you see it's preclinical, that's the test tube phase, and they also use animal studies. So then they say, okay, this, this toxin looks like it's really gonna be helpful. So let's move it to the next phase. So they move it to phase one, where they're testing it in a few subjects, and you can see it's 20 to 80 participants, and they look at that and see if it's safe. So the primary thing is, is this the great medicine for the, at this point? It's, is it safe to actually use? So they do a lot of different kinds of studies to make sure that it's safe. So you might get chest x-rays, EKGs, all kinds of different tests to see if anything goes wrong with the, with the drug. So if it passes that and everyone does well, it moves on to phase two, which is where you go from 100 to 300 participants. And at this phase, you're looking at a little bit more, not just is it safe, but also does the drug do what we think it's going to do? Is it going to be effective? And sometimes that's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, but phase three is when they expand it to a larger group of, of patients. And usually multiple centers across the country will be involved in that. And then it will be submitted to the FDA for review. And then the FDA will determine whether it is safe and effective and whether it can be marketed in this country. Then after it's been approved, sometimes companies will do phase four studies. And this is with a much larger number of people. Um, this is because a lot of times you won't really know whether there's any bad side effects until a whole lot of people are using it for a long period of time. 
So it takes a little bit more than a few months to really tell. And that's why sometimes they'll do phase four studies. So that's the process by which these drugs are developed. You have to know a few things. First of all, remember, participation in a clinical trial is completely voluntary and it should be completely free of charge. Now, uh, there have been some trials that have been out there that they have tried to charge patients for. This is not a real clinical trial. This is a way for some people to make money, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are out there that do that kind of a thing. Um, so know that all of the studies done in this country, you should not have to pay anything. The study pays for everything. So in other words, if you're one of those in phase one and you have to be staying in a hospital, have your blood drawn frequently, have EKGs and chest x-rays, all of that is covered by the study. You don't have to use your medical insurance for any of that, okay? Now, uh, the other thing that you have to also remember is that this is completely voluntary. There is nothing that's going to happen if you say, I do not want to be part of a study. Nothing's gonna happen with your medical care, your physician's still gonna treat you, you're gonna still go on with the same way that you always have. It's not going to affect you. And the other thing is, is, okay, say you say, oh yeah, I think that'd be interesting, I'm gonna do this. But then you find out you have a lot of stuff coming up, you don't have a lot of time, you can't really make it to all these, meet, all these, um, these visits because there's usually more frequent visits than what you have with your doctor on a regular basis. So you might say, I just can't do this right now, I have to drop out of the study. That is okay too, because you can withdraw consent at any time. So you can decide to start the study, you can withdraw. All of this is not going to affect your medical care. But there is, um, yeah, so. Okay, so then what I did is I started from step by step. So let's say you've already gone past that. You decide, I wanna be part of this clinical trial. So you, first step is they're going to do what they call a screening visit. Screening. Screening means they're looking for a specific group of patients. So in other words, like the Daxybotulinum toxin study, they're looking for people who have cervical dystonia. They may or may not have had other uh, types of toxin injections, but yet if they have, they have to be at least three months out from their last set of injections. So in other words, they wanna see you at your worst. And if you have exactly what they're looking for, you can become a participant. So the screening visit goes through a lot of different things. They're gonna look at your medications, your medical history, they're gonna do a physical exam, they may do other tests like EKG and the chest x-ray, and make sure that everything goes along with your part of that group that they want in the study. If you are not one of those, or say you have uh, an abnormality in one of your labs or something, don't feel bad that you're not part of the study. And sometimes it's not because of anything abnormal, but because maybe you don't have as bad of a dystonia as they want. So they do a scale called the Twisters. Uh, Toronto, Western, um, I forget the rest of it. Anyways, it's a torticollis scale. And they measure how badly your back is turned, rotated, tilted, or shifted and how it affects you with your daily life. So if you have a fairly mild case of cervical dystonia, you would have a low twister score. So maybe your twister score is too low. That's not a bad thing. It just means that maybe it's not high enough for the study. So it's not a bad thing, and a lot of times you, it, it kind of hurts your feelings because they say, no, you're not really what we're looking for. But it just, you know, sometimes means you're better than what, they, what they're looking for. Okay, the next visit that you will have is the baseline visit. And this one is where you will be at your baseline. So in other words, for the Daxybotulinum toxin type study, you would be off of 
all toxin injections. So remember, three months, it's pretty much back to your baseline. You would have to wait and have the original symptoms that you have and uh, be evaluated at that point. Again, they'll do the same kind of, of tests and things to make sure that you're still qualified to be part of the study. Now, this part is where we decide what part of the study you're going to be part of. So, in order to tell if a medicine works or not, you have to compare it to something. What you compare it to is called a placebo. And a placebo is just an inactive treatment. So it can be exactly the same, say it's a pill, it can be, have everything in it that the pill, the drug has, but not the active ingredient. So by taking that pill, you would really not know whether you have the uh, study drug or whether you have a placebo. Now why are they doing that? There's a really good um, placebo response. Just taking a pill can make you feel better. So a lot of times it may, your mind thinks you're going to get better because you took that pill. You are going to experience some improvement. So this is what's called the placebo effect. That improvement can be up to 40%. So it's a pretty high amount. So you have to compare the drug to a placebo. So that's really the main reason why we need placebo studies. So a lot of times, if you are involved in a study where you may have the possibility of getting a placebo, at the end of the study, they'll open up what they call open label, and then they'll allow you to all get the drug. So whether you've been on the drug or you've had the placebo, you're all gonna start getting the drug now. Um, now the other thing about the placebo effect is it doesn't usually last as long as the medication effect. So that's also why studies take a bit longer. You can't just tell within one or two doses or one or two weeks, sometimes it takes a couple months, and then the placebo effect starts to wane because there's no drug effect there. So it, it takes a little bit more time. That's another thing why people always wonder, why does it take so long to get new studies? and new research. Okay, now that you're, you've gone through the screening, you've passed the baseline, you're now in the study group, now you're gonna go through the study visits. And this is where you're going to have some tests, not as many as you had at first, but some tests, like with dexybotulinum toxin, it would be the twister scale, you have that. Um, and then you'll be given the treatments or medication during these visits. At the end, you're gonna go through what they call a termination visit. Sounds very bad, doesn't it, termination? But it's just the last visit for the study. And it's also, if you decide that you don't like the study, you don't wanna be a part of the study, and you wanna withdraw, they're gonna ask you to come back for a termination visit because what they want to see is how you are at the end of the study. So are you better than you were when you first started? Are you the same? Is there any difference between the two conditions? So they do want to make sure that you have that last visit. And they will do a lot of uh, the same tests they did at the first visit at the last visit as well. Now, the next part that I had in here was the different types of studies. So you're gonna hear words and you're gonna know what they mean now. Open label means everyone knows that you're getting the medication. So you will know, your doctor will know, and you'll get the medication. Double blind, this means that you and the doctor, neither one of you know what you're getting, whether you're getting the drug or you're not getting the drug. Because believe it or not, we want you to feel better. So we want, we will, sometimes influence the study unknowingly by knowing that we're giving you the right thing. Oh, I think they're getting better. So the physician can't know what it is either. Um, and then randomized. So the studies you usually will see are double blind, 
placebo-controlled randomized study. These are the gold standard of tests, of studies that the FDA requires before medication can be approved for the US. Randomized means that whether you start on the drug or the placebo is, on, is random. So it's like a flip of a coin whether you get it or not. And they have all kinds of computer programs that decide which subject is getting which. It's not really based on anything you do or anything we do. It just, it's random. Okay, so if you're interested in being part of any of these clinical trials, what are you gonna do? Well, you can talk to your doctor because you're, the uh, neurologist who is injecting you is probably doing some of these studies. Um, they may not, and if they don't, they can tell you which sites are doing these studies. Also, you can get this off of the NIH website. It's clinicaltrials.gov and they have listed all of the different studies that are ongoing in the United States. You have to look based upon condition, and that's how you, you get to know whether there's, uh, whether there's a study there or not.